Boom, da -da boom, da -da boom. Today's lesson, we're going to like, fix the accent. Uh, today, we're going to finish up our revision schedule. Like this entire week, we've been revising the entire physics syllabus, which is quite the achievement. So, good job on uh, staying alive until now and uh, you know persevering. Also, about another hand, Kalaman Unit One, hey, general physics and mechanics. We've got a lot of topics to cover. They're all relatively important. That's if not so what. We've seen these details over and over again. So just focus here. And if you have questions, like I said, write them in caps lock. Keep the chat clean, guys, please. And uh, let's get started. <sighs> First, we're going to talk about measurements. What are physical quantities? What units do we use? How do we convert units? What instruments do we use to measure them? And we'll talk about density. We'll then talk about speed, acceleration, and the speed and distance time graphs. What forces are and... Uh, like the different types of forces that we have and how do we get the resultant force. We'll also talk about Newton's laws of motion, my first and second law, pre IG second law, Momentum, this is not for your nine, but so this is something related to Newton's laws of motion, forces with Kedah. Hooke's law, which is basically us discussing springs and such, pressure, because force over area and how <clears throat> a force is spread over a specific point or maybe concentrate at a certain point. To break through things and I put pressure by solids and by a liquids. I already talked about pressure and gases of uh, unit two thermal physics. Go back to that video if you haven't seen it yet. Moments and it can on a turning effect of a force. Like when you apply a force on an object, if you pivot, it rotates. And finally, energy work and power what these quantities are, how do we measure them or calculate them, and uh, the different types of power stations that we have. Let's get started right away. What's a physical quantity? A physical quantity is uh, a quantity that has what we call a magnitude, a value, something that we measure, right? Things like length and time and mass and temperature and such. And all quantities have magnitude, which means the value, and the unit of measurement. Now, we're not going to go through all the units because the units we care about are what we call the SI units, which is short for the International System or the International Standard of Units. Length is going to be measured in meters, SI. Time is in seconds, mass is in kilograms, temperature is in Kelvin, although Celsius, we will not be using Kelvin for syllabus, but we need to know that Celsius is not the SI unit. But it's not the SI unit. And current is in A ampere. For these are the units we basically use. Prefixes, but we've seen them a lot as we've solved things. So three prefixes are super important to us. The kilo the centi and the milli. So for example, if I were to tell you I have uh, I traveled a distance of 15 kilometers, how many meters is that? So it's 15 times 1,000. The multiplier in maktub here. So 15 times 1,000, you have 15 a thousand meters. So when you want to remove the prefix, بتشيلها وبتحط مكانها ال multiplier that's here. Uh, for example, if I want to change millimeters to meters, or milliseconds to meters, we've seen that before for electricity. Uh, for example, if it's 25 milliampere, like we solved the last time, so that's 25 divided by a thousand, which gives you 0 0.025 ampere. So you just need to know how to convert units. Okay, good, next. First two quantities we'll talk about are time and mass. Time is measured using a stop clock, a clock or a timer. And it's pretty simple, but so there's only one thing you need to know is uh, a technique that you need to know is how to get the time for one oscillation of a pendulum. Ten, one oscillation. What do we do? We have to measure the time for, for example, 10 oscillations on the stopwatch. And we're going to measure the time of 10 back and forth cycles. One, two, three, four. And then we divide the time by the number of oscillations. So, for example, Here's a stopwatch, and uh, a lot of people don't know how to measure things from a stopwatch, so I want to clarify how to read a stopwatch right now. This uh, first number, this first number over here, this is usually the minute marker. Sometimes we have hours, but we only side. This is the second marker, and this is what we call the millisecond marker, or one over 100 seconds. So if I had to write this number down, I would say 3 minutes and 43.75 seconds, okay? So that's how we sometimes use the stopwatch. Uh, so when we want to measure the time for one complete oscillation, we measure time for 10 oscillations and divide it by 10, or more if you want. 
How do we measure mass? Well, we measure mass with a balance. You have different types of balances from the you know, top end balance, what we call a spring balance. This is what we call a beam balance, where it balances two things. I, I keep saying the word balance, it's getting being balanced. <laughs> anyway, there's one technique that you must know, and that's how to get the mass of a liquid. The problem with liquids is that they don't have a fixed shape, so you have to put them inside a container. If you put the container with the liquid on a balance, uh, it'll give you a reading, but that's not the reading of the liquid. That's the liquid with the container. So to get the mass of a liquid, dang, to get the mass of a liquid, let's call this M, I need to measure the mass of the empty container. Let's call this M1. I need to measure the mass of the container with the liquid, M2. So the mass of the liquid is the difference, M2 minus M1. So in this particular example, it's 250 minus 200, which is 50 grams. That's only if you want the A liquid. Capish? Excellent. Next, how do we measure length? Well, length is easy. We use a meter rule. That's what we usually do, rulers. We use a measuring tape if we want to measure super long distances. And we use a micrometer. This is not for year nine, okay? Not year nine. We use a micrometer if we want to measure very, very, very small objects. Okay, that's, that's all we need to know when it comes to the instruments themselves. There are two techniques that are important when it comes to measuring length. And the first is, how do I measure the thickness of something really thin, like a sheet of paper? What we do is we get lots of sheets of paper. Let's say I have uh, 100 sheets over here. We measure the thickness of all of these sheets together. So let's say this is about uh, 10 centimeters. And then we simply divide the reading by the number of sheets. So the thickness of one sheet is 10 divided by 100, which gives us 0.1 centimeters. It's not exactly accurate, but still, it's around that. Cool. Uh, the second is, how do I get the diameter of a ball? Because a ball doesn't really have edges, you can't really put it on top of a ruler and get an accurate measurement because these two ends are not going to be aligned properly. So what we do is we get two blocks of wood, we put them next to the ball, and then we measure the distance between the two blocks. So for example, in this case, this starts at two, this ends at four, so the diameter of, of this ball is about two centimeters. Okay, good. Next, volume. Volume is defined as the space occupied by an object. Occupied by an object. It's basically how big or small an object is. And to get the volume, we have three techniques. First, if it's a solid, you just get the volume of the solid using one of the equations we have, like length times width times height. That's if you have a volume of a cuboid or something, not similar. Uh, if you have, second, if you have only a liquid, you just pour the liquid into a measuring cylinder. And finally, if you have an irregular solid like this, you know, rock over here, if I want to find the volume of this irregular solid, this rock. What we first do is we get a measuring cylinder and we pour some water inside it, just enough to be the exact same size of the rock, just to fill it up, cover it uh, with water. Let's call this volume one. And then we gently put the rock into the water so that it does not splash, that's a precaution, and the level of the water will rise. This gives you a new volume, V2. So the volume of the rock is going to be V2 minus V1, okay? This method is called the displacement method. Excellent. Let's move on now. Next, uh, the final thing when it comes to measurements, or not really the final, the final quantity we want to talk about would be density. Density is simply defined as the mass per unit volume of a substance. How would be different between one material to another? And sometimes you have materials that are small, but heavy. They have a lot of weight, they have a lot of mass to them. We say that these objects have a very high density. Uh, objects that are large, but light, like a balloon, they have a small amount of weight and a small amount of mass. We say they have a very low density. So density, tiny, is the mass per unit A volume. The more dense an object is, the smaller it is, and the more mass it has. The less dense an object is, the larger it is, and the less mass it has. 
uh, since the unit of mass is kilograms, usually, and the unit of volume would be meter cubed, because remember, length times width times height is meter times meter times meter. So we usually use the unit kilogram per meter cubed. Sometimes you say gram per centimeter cubed, but that depends on the question. Like if the question is using grams, like this example we'll solve now, we just use grams and centimeter cubed. If the question is using kilograms and meter cubed, we use that unit. Uh, one more thing about density before we solve this example is that density affects how objects float or sink. If I have a container filled with a liquid and I put an object inside and this object is less dense than the liquid, it will float. However, if I have another object, another material, and that's important, another material that is more dense than the liquid, it will sink. It's quite simple. Density does not change, okay? As long as the material is the same, the density does not change. There's only one thing that can change density. And if you remember, that was in unit one, that is temperature. If the temperature of a substance increases, the density decreases. And vice versa, if the temperature of a substance decreases, the density increases. Well, that can be said in a convection can be styled. This is how convection worked. It worked because of uh, the change in density of a substance. Now, let's solve this example really quick. It says a 500 gram, so let's underline that, 500 gram block is 10 centimeter by 2 by 5. And technically, he gave me the length, width, and height. Basically, we deal in volume. Calculate the density. So what's the equation? We say density equals mass over volume. The mass is 500 over 2 uh, by 5 by 10, which is the number he gave me up here. Pulling out our trusty calculator. So 500 divided by 2 by 5 by 10 would give me 5. 5 eba gram per centimeter cubed because I used both grams and centimeter cubed in the question. So we're also going to be using grams and centimeter cubed in our answer. Okay, excellent. Finally, to finish up measurements. Uh, we have to talk about errors. There are three significant types of errors. The first is called the zero error, and this exists when the zero of the instrument is either not there, or if you have something like a stopwatch that you forget to reset. Okay, uh, you can avoid a zero error by resetting the stopwatch or digital instrument, or in this case, if I want to measure the length of this object, it's quite simple. We just take the reading over here, we take the reading on this side, and we get the difference. That's how we get the length, by avoiding zero error. Uh, sometimes the instrument is broken. Sometimes I'm the one who chooses not to put the zero. In the end, it's still called a zero error. It's very easily avoidable. The second type of error is called a parallax error. And this exists when you do not look at the instrument, especially if it's a cylinder or ruler, with the correct angle. Looking at an angle when you're measuring the surface of this liquid will end up giving you a reading because your eyesight passes through this value over here end up giving your reader reading either larger or smaller than the real value. And I'll end up seeing a value that's smaller than what's real. So this is wrong and this is also wrong. The only correct way to look at an instrument is to look at it perpendicularly. Like your line of sight has to be perpendicular to the measuring instrument. That's how you avoid parallax error. Sometimes we will parallax error be line of, oops, I forgot the name, line of sight error. That's another name for it, that's all. Great. Okay. Finally, the meniscus error. The meniscus error is unique, as in it only occurs in liquids. If you have a liquid inside a measuring cylinder, the surface is never perfectly flat. The water level actually curves a bit. فبالنسبة لأي حد بيبص هو actually بيشوف two readings يعني if I were looking at this instrument over here and I was trying to get a reading also by looking perpendicular and avoiding parallax error I would actually see two readings that the liquid shows me بيوريني مثلا ال 46D and the 48 and the question is which one is correct الشوية الليكود اللي طالعين دول اللي في الحتة دي they're pretty worthless يعني insignificant we always look at the bottom of what we call the meniscus. This curving of the water is called the meniscus. So we always look at the bottom of the meniscus. 
Uh, one exception is mercury. Mercury is one of the few substances uh, that does not curve down. It actually curves up. It bulges up. So this is mercury. In the case of mercury, we always look at the top of this meniscus because the shwayal curving in the hasa they're very small. So tiny. Meniscus in water, you look at the bottom. Meniscus, uh, you know, uh, in mercury, you look at the top. Excellent. Finally, قبل ما ندخل بقى في speed of acceleration, this is not for year nine, okay? يا جماعة إحنا عندنا two different types of quantities. اسمهم scalars and vectors. Scalars are quantities that have only magnitude, زي length و time و mass و density. Meaning, لو أنا قلت لك, where's my pen? لو أنا قلت لك that the mass, my mass, مثلاً is seventy four kilograms. ما فيش حاجة اسمها 74 kilograms up, down, left, right. You can understand me perfectly. لو أنا قلت لك I went running today. I ran for a time of, you know, one hour. ما فرقتش معايا لو الأور جريتها يمين أو شمال ما أثرتش على الإفكت بتاع الإيه الكوانتيتي. So direction does not matter. ليه بقول الكلمة دي? Because vectors are quantities that have to be described using both magnitude and direction. زي الفورس مثلا. A force is a push or a pull. فمثلا if I tell you I have a box and I push it forward with a force of 10 newtons I have to tell you the direction because if I just tell you hey here's a box and I apply the force of 10 newtons إذا طب ثانية واحدة مش الدايركشن هي أصر فهي راحت فين like if I push it to the left or I push it to the right or I pull it up or maybe I'm pushing it down كل دول بيغيروا الإيه الإفكت بتاع الكوانتيتي so you must add the direction. Quantities that have to be mentioned with the direction is one vectors. Another vector that we are very familiar with is moment. And if I apply a force on an object and it turns, it could either turn clockwise or it could either turn anti-clockwise, depending on the direction of the force. For the direction, in this case, is important. Okay, so from now on, quantities that have only uh, magnitude are called scalars. Vectors are quantities that have both magnitude and direction. Great. Uh, taking a moment. So Taeli and Dukuba so Wati. Really? Can you guys confirm that in the Soti Wati? Okay, uh, let's go through the chat quick. And I mean, if sessions go, oh, we've already discussed that. Uh, uh, ممكن تعلي صوتك شوية. If it's really low, to بسنا حتى أقرب المايك شوية, because I put it really far to avoid the crackling and everything else. So we're doing a quick sound test دلوقتي يا جماعة. Let me know if the sound is fine, or if uh, لو الفوليوم أنتوا عندكم واطيين, just be careful with that. أنا هتشيك برضو عندي على السيستم لو أنا موطي الفوليوم لا أنا معلي الفوليوم وعامله بوست ف nothing has changed when it comes to my volume uh... okay Okay. Uh, ثاني صوت عالي هي A velocity. أدهم دي حاجة year اسمه ده year ten. And velocity is speed. It's just another word for speed. أنا صوت عادي. أنا صوت عادي. It's fine. It's now fine. خلاص كده كويس. Okay. Looking perpendicular to the ruler معناه إن the line of sight بتاعك يبقى perpendicular to the ruler. ما تبقىش بصص بانجل. يعني زي كده. This is looking perpendicular. Excellent. لو كده كويس هنكمل. Okay. Let's continue. بقى. يعني زين بقى نتكلم عن ال speed وال acceleration وكده. Movement in general. So we have two quantities that we care about when it comes to motion. حاجة اسمها speed وحاجة اسمها ايه acceleration. Speed is quite simple. How fast you're moving. It's calculated using distance over time. مش صعبة بصراحة كquantity ومش محتاجة شرح كتير. The unit of measurement speed is either meters per second لو إحنا شغالين SI units أو it's kilometers per a 
hour. Okay, yeah, meters per second, yeah, Emma, kilometers per hour. However, if I do ask you to calculate the average speed, we just calculate the total distance over total time. Leave only only because sometimes I give you a like realistically, if I am in my car and I am moving. Uh, realistically, I keep on any of them. at constant speed to look at the speed that is at the seat, but sometimes I have to stop. Sometimes I take a right, I take a left, and in speed that it taught to see the Maybe I go back, I move forward, and it takes me a certain amount of time to reach my destination. When I want to calculate the average speed, my other show like, oh, but I don't know if the inner show if I'm sure I said, well, I've it took me that much time to reach the destination, then that is my total time. Can في example مرة في امتحان multiple choice ضحك عليكو قال لكو the distance traveled by a car is a hundred kilometers or a truck the time taken was two a hours calculate the average speed وعادي ي كلام كتير كمبو like the maximum speed it reached was eighty and the lowest speed was forty ده كان بس بيضحك عليكو to calculate speed is quite simple distance over time so a hundred over two so it's fifty kilometers per hour. That was speed. Next up, يعني acceleration. Acceleration is defined as the rate of change in speed, or the change in speed over time. Now, your tens, خدوا بالكم من حاجة, and we don't actually say change in speed, we just say change in velocity. وها وضح لكم الفرق ما بين speed و velocity دلوقتي. خلاص. The unit of measurement is meters per second squared because it's meter per second over second. فكلمة acceleration simply means إن speed تغير. زاد أو أقل, it doesn't matter. We call it acceleration. However, low speed L, sometimes you give it a special term, which we call deceleration. Deceleration is defined as the decrease in speed. Okay? If acceleration means change, A change, Z L, usually man has it. Deceleration man has speed L. Okay? Now, should be your 10? Let's see how do we use the equation and what's the difference between the velocity and speed. Acceleration, as I said, is defined as the change in velocity over time. Velocity is speed, but it is a vector. Velocity is a vector. In other words, the meaning of direction بيفرق معايا. This will not be really important غير لما ندخل في forces. So ignore فكرة the direction for now. لحد ما نتكلم عن forces كمان شوية. So here's a quick example. A ball is dropped from a tall building. It takes a certain amount of time, a few seconds. Let's underline this uh, value. To reach the ground and it falls with an acceleration of 10. Okay, so what Daniel A acceleration? Acceleration is 10 and then time. Calculate the speed at which the ball hits the ground. The why is it speed or velocity? So what's the equation? Acceleration equals change in velocity over time. What do I want? I want the velocity, so make it the subject. And on velocity equals acceleration times L time. Acceleration is cam 10. Times the time is three point two. It's literally thirty two meters per a per second. Now, خدوا بالكم حاجة. That's the change in velocity. يعني the velocity is added by thirty two. Velocity is added by thirty two. But if you take a look, we get like a ball is dropped from a tall building. طالما it's been dropped, it بدأ معناه it's dropped with a speed of zero. يعني بدأ بقى ترست. So if the initial speed is zero, و زاد by thirty two, it بقى the final speed is also thirty two. Okay. نرجع بقى تاني يا شباب كله بقى معايا 10 و 9 We have two different types of graphs which we will be using speed time graphs uh, sorry distance time graphs and speed time graphs Both of these graphs represent motion because رخم قوي ان اقعد احكي الموفمنت عامل ازاي يعني صعب قوي ان اقعد اقول لك انا مشيت 10 meters وقفت ومشيت 5 meters وقفت ورجعت 7 meters يعني نرسم جرافس وخلاص so a distance time graph shows you distance. Okay. For that, we are in a. I'm going to cut the line with a. We are in a, and the distance with z. But as long as the line is straight, we say that we're moving at a constant speed. Okay. However, if the line is horizontal, that means that the distance is not changing. This means that I'm at the eight meter mark. Meaning, if I start over here. وفي حد حاطط رولر على الارض بيقرا 0 2 4 6 8 10 كده ده معناه ان افتر 4 seconds انا دلوقتي رحت وقفت عند مين ال 8 فتحركت however من 4 لحد 7 seconds my distance is still 
8 ده معناها I'm still standing at the position 8 Sometimes it's better to think of distance as your position عشان ما تفتكرش ان انا مشيت 8 تانية لا It simply means I'm standing at a distance of 8 فدي معناها ان I'm at a rest a distance of the Irish Okay? Cool The only thing I can calculate from a speed time graph uh, from a distance time graph is speed بالإكويشن احنا عارفينها اللي هي distance over time So let's calculate the speed for AB because احنا عارفين BC ما فيش عم at rest So what's the speed of AB? فنقول distance over time A distance by 8 over time which is 4 8 over 4 by 2 a unit by Here it's meters and here it's second so it's meters per second However, if I ask you to calculate the average speed as I'm going about average speed, I have a total distance over a total time. A total distance is still 8. And if I have a I've still only traveled the distance of 8. A total time is actually 7. So, total distance, which is 8, over total time, which is 7. This gives me, pulling out my trusty calculator, 8 divided by 7, it's 1.14. 1.14. Meters per second. That distance time graph. Next, the last type of graph is called the speed time graph, and a speed time graph simply shows you a speed we have to It doesn't show you distance; it just shows you the speed. So uh, let's take a look. Can I be only from A to B in the speed Z from zero to eight meters per second? ده مش بيورينا مشيت مسافة قد ايه، it simply shows you أنا سرعتي زادت بقد ايه، يعني لو في العربية وقدامي عدت سرعة، it was measuring 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, وراني وصلت ل 8. It might seem pretty slow بالنسبة لكم، but don't forget this is meters per second. طيب، فده معناه إن speed زاد. If we want to describe it, we just call this acceleration. طيب، BC however وريني ان السبيد ما بيتغيرش ان السبيد ما بيتغيرش معناه I'm still moving but at a constant speed تاني I'm still moving but at a constant speed but this means I'm moving at a steady speed ساعتها يقول steady ساعتها يقول uniform ساعتها يقول constant they all mean the same thing طب C بقى D oops I didn't mean to flip slides right now C D represents A بقى in the speed bit A bit L yeah, the speed is decreasing right now for D hat up D acceleration okay now if you're looking for when does it become at rest uh, and it's literally horizontal at zero the man at a rest but it literally has to be at zero speed please do not confuse my being a straight line here or being a straight line that we were retaining at rest because this distance is not changing. The distance is not changing. That we were constant speed because the speed is not changing. That means that 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 the speed is not changing. I can calculate a couple of things from a speed time graph. The first is the distance. If you want to calculate distance, from a speed time graph, do not use the equation distance equals speed times time or speed equals distance over time. That's because most of the time the speed is not constant. Yani what A B U C D the speed is constant. So I can't really use this. No. Instead, we just get the area under the graph. If I get the area under the graph, the answer will give us the distance. So let's give it a shot. A distance traveled from A to B. And what's the distance here? And all uh, an area of a triangle. This is a triangle, by the way. This entire area in the under the graph line. And all the area is half times base times height. So half times four times eight. Because the base here is four, and height here is eight. So 0.5 times four times eight. This gives you 16. فاحنا كده جبنا الديستنس هنا ترافلد ب 16 16 ايه بقى؟ اليونت هنا متر اجين ذس وان از ايزي ذس شيب از ا ريكتانجل فهنقول بيس تايمز هايت اللي هو بيس اللي هو من 4 ل 7 سو ذاتس ا 3 تايمز هايت ويتش از ستيل 8 سو 3 تايمز 8 ود جيف مي 24 
واخر حاجة لا هو أنا عايز ال you know آخر distance that depends on what he asks for really آخر distance هنا برضو سهلة هنقول half times base times height because it's a triangle so half times base which is two and then seven to nine it's two times height which is eight which gives you eight meters. The one but if I ask you to get the total distance. دي غصب عنك هتضطر تجيب كل شيب لوحده يعني لازم اجيب ده which is 16 اجيب ده which is 24 اجيب ده which is 8 and then you just add the numbers together so total distance is going to be 16 plus 24 plus 8 this gives you 48 meters great Now, a section جاي ودي آخر حتة في speed time graphs. A section اللي جاي ده مش layer nine ف you ممكن تفصل المدة دي أو دقيقتين maximum وهنرجع تاني ليك. If I ask you to calculate acceleration, يا شباب, acceleration is calculated using the exact same equation, change in velocity over time. So if I want to calculate the acceleration with a b, هتقولوا change in speed أو velocity over time. The speed And the beep eight, and the beep zero. Fell change of eight over the time here of four over zero. For time here of four, the acceleration is still two meters per second a squared. Now I'm about to ask the acceleration of the C D. To only, but no, Mister, that's not acceleration. That's deceleration. Well, I forget the thing. If you want to get acceleration or deceleration, you use the exact same equation, the exact same way. What was the velocity? It was eight over zero. Fell change less of eight. Over what's the time? Seven nine by two. How well? The difference in the time. I get lolly. In the end, four meters per second squared. Excellent. So that's how you can calculate acceleration. And finally, we have many different types of speed time graphs because خدوا بالكوا أمن حاجة. In a line of the graph, the speed time graph, you are present the acceleration. كل ما line يبقى steeper يعني طالع له فوق أكتر كده. Acceleration أعلى كل يبقى less steep الacceleration إيه أقل وطبعا لو اللاين أصلا نازل مش طالع دي بتتسمى إيه deceleration فكل ما slope يبقى vertical أكتر أو أعلى أكتر الacceleration أعلى ليه بقول بقى الكلمة دي الأول because لو اللاين مش straight مش هيبقى constant acceleration أو deceleration لو اللاين straight أو لو اللاين sorry be curved الاكسلريشن هتتغير ممكن تي انكريز ممكن تي ديكريز طب تيجي تقول لي طب ماشي انت رسمت لي كل دول ايش عرفني بقى انكريزنج ولا ديكريزنج ركز ستيب نمبر 1 شوف لو اللاين طالع لفوق اصلا لايك اف ذا سبيد واز لو اند ذن اتس انكريز دي اسمها اكسلريشن ما فيهاش نقاش الاثنين دول اسمهم اكسلريشن سكند لو السلوب بتاع اللاين زاد يعني لو اللاين في الاول نايم وفي الاخر بقى واقف ستاندنج اب السلوب الجراديان زاد بنقول على ده ايه انكريزنج The كلمة increasing ده بي represent the slope تاني. كلمة increasing بي represent the slope. لو هنا بقى slope عالي ونزل وقل ده بنقول عليه ايه decreasing عشان slope قل. For both of these are considered acceleration. بس ده مش constant. It's acceleration هنا بيزيد. يعني كأني دوست بنزين خفيف في الأول وبعد كده دوست بنزين جامد فزاد. هنا كأني دوست بنزين جامد في الأول وبعد كده شلت رجلي شوية مع بنزين. So I'm still accelerating. بس مش زي الأول. دي بقى اسمها deceleration، دي برضه اسمها deceleration عشان السبيد ماله قل، يعني السبيد كان عالي وبقى قليل. فدي اسمها deceleration. دي بقى اسمها increasing deceleration، ليه؟ عشان السلوب في الأول كان نايم كده، وبعد كده بقى إيه؟ vertical. كان horizontal وبعد كده بقى vertical. In other words، السلوب زاد. تيجي تقول لي بس السبيد قل، أوكي، جود جاب، مش مهم. المهم إن السلوب زاد يعني ده كاني دوست فرامل براحه في الاول سو ام سلوينج داون فيري سلولي وبعد كده دوست فرامل فجاه فنزل سبيد ايه فجاه فدي اسمها انكريزنج ديسلريشن تاني انكريزنج ديسلريشن لسه سبيد بيقل يعني انا بدات مثلا بسبيد 10 وبعد كده بقى 9 وبعد كده بقى 8 وبعد كده بقى 5 وبعد كده بقى 2 وبعد كده بقى 0 مثلا ان الدروب في الاول كان 1 1 3 يعني حبه كتير كلمة بقى decreasing deceleration معناها ان السلوب في الاول كان واقف وبعد كده بقى نايم يعني قل ال deceleration deceleration قلت in other words فرمل جامد في الاول وبعد كده ريح الفرامل في الاخر for example I can start at 10 وبعد كده هنط ال 5 فجأة 
بعد كده من 5 لايه ل 3 بعد كده من 3 ل 2 من 2 ل 1 بعد كده 1 ل 0.5 بعد كده يعني في الاول بينزل جامد قوي بعد كده النزول ده بيقل 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 In both of these cases, or all four of these cases, you need to memorize two things. Number one, how acceleration, or deceleration. Number two, listen to know how the increasing or the decreasing. Okay. Number one. Before I talk about forces, what's the best answer on the question in the chat? What is the meaning of look? The only half. Finished. Okay, so no other questions? Excellent. Whew, okay. Good, good. We're making great time. Oh, darn. My soup got cold. It's <laughs> yeah. Okay. Actually, let it. Oh, my God. I've been here for a while. Yeah, I mean, what's a force? A force is defined as a push or a pull. And when you push something, pull something, that's called a force. It's measured in a unit called Newton. We're familiar with this particular unit. You know, it can move an object. It can change its speed. It can change its direction. It can change the shape and size. You can stretch something and compress it. That's everything that a force can a do. But so there are certain forces whose names we need to know. And in the same time, we need to know a few details of. First, the most important force is weight, which is defined as the pull of gravity. Weight is the pull of gravity. It's the only force that we have in the equation. W equals mg. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. So W equals mg. W is going to be the weight. M is going to be the mass. And G is always a constant 10. Meters per second squared on Earth. خلاص. So, for example, if I tell you again, and I have a mass, for example, of seventy-four kilograms, this means my weight is W equals m g. So seventy-four times ten equals seven hundred and forty meters. Okay. Cool. The next force we need to talk about is what happens when you have two surfaces rubbing against each other. When you push an object forward, the Roughness of the two surfaces creates a force called friction. It's always opposite to your direction of motion. And it always tries to slow you down and it releases heat. Only happens when you have two solid surfaces rubbing against each other. However, if I have a, something like a car that's moving forward through the air, it also applies or experiences friction with the air. And we call this air resistance. We call this air resistance, or what we sometimes call drag. Okay, so air resistance or drag, okay, is friction but with the air. This depends on two things. Number one, your speed. Coulomb speed with attack with z, the air resistance with a with z, and second, your area. Coulomb the area with z, the air resistance bordo with a with z, because again you're hitting more air molecules along the way. Okay, good. Uh-huh, okay. Oh, uh, okay, sorry. Is a push or a pull? Cool. Next up, if you have an object that you tie with a rope or a thread, the thread, the force inside the thread is called tension. And it's not always inside the thread, inside a rope or a thread or a spring or anything that you stretch. The force that it has is called tension. The force that it has is called tension. Please do not confuse this with energy, which we'll talk about later. If I have a box and it's in water and it's floating, that's because the water always applies an upward force on the box, which we call upthrust. So upthrust is just the name of the force caused by a liquid, and it's always upwards. Finally, if you have two surfaces in contact with each other and they're not moving any surface way, if it's easy, the surface applies a force on the object. In this case, the box. This upward force or this perpendicular force is what we call the normal contact force. يعني 
من اسمها it exists when two surfaces are in contact with a, each other any two solid surfaces in contact with each other apply a contact force on a, each other yes. next if it's better on the octal one force because that's basically what we'll talk about in a bit what happens when we have more than one force acting on an object if i have something like this box and i apply a force to the right of 10 newtons uh, to the right, but 6 newtons. The box will move to the right, 16 newtons. This combination or sum of the forces is called the resultant force. So the resultant force is nothing more than one force that has the same effect as the combination of all the, the combination of all the forces. So that's what we call the resultant force. Next. What if the forces are in opposite directions? And if it's low, the ten newtons to the mean, or six newtons to the this means the object is still going to move to the right with the force of a four newtons. This is still called the resultant force, but in this case, you subtracted the two values when they were in opposite a directions. You add the two values when they're in the same direction. That's how you get the resultant force. Cool. Cool. Next up. Uh, this is for not for year 9, this is for year 10s and 11s. Basically, what if the two forces are not along the same line? And if the low 10 newtons leaning here, and 6 newtons the full. You cannot add them and you cannot a, subtract them. What we do instead is we follow a method called the parallelogram method. We have to draw this to scale. For example, let's say our scale is every 1 centimeter on our piece of paper is 1 newton. And you can الخطوط, the two forces دول, to scale. أول force are سمو, هيبقى to the right, which is 10 centimeters. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. I'm trying to keep this to scale as much as I can. We need to value 10 newtons. Second, we need to the force at the same angle, but it's almost both. This is supposed to be 90. It's hard to draw on this thing. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So that's. Once you've gotten these two, the resultant force will affect the shape that into what we call a parallelogram. Because the resultant force is going to be somewhere in between. Realistically, have a diagonal force, a diagonal betal a parallelogram. So what we do is we draw a horizontal line here. Let me change the color hatta. We're going to draw a horizontal line over here. لازم يبقى perfectly parallel لل A الخط اللي تحت ده. And then we're going to draw another parallel line over here. Parallel لمين بقى؟ للفورس الأولين. So you have two lines that you're going to draw now. One from the end of the 6 newton parallel لل 10. واحد from the end of the 10 parallel لل 6. المهم إنه هيقفل على شكل parallelogram أو in this case a rectangle. The resultant force is going to be the diagonal اللي هو من starting point بتاع الرسمة للintersection بتاع ال A. Letting values or the two lines. This is what we call the A resultant. Since we've drawn this to scale, so I would say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, which way? So I would say, I don't know, 9.5 centimeters. So that's about 9.5 A newtons. Obviously, when you do this with a ruler and a protractor and you measure things accurately, it's much more accurate. But so that's how we use the parallelogram method to find the resulting force. Okay. That's how you get the resulting force. Thank you, so by the way. Moving on back. Let's go back to Newton's laws of motion. Adam Khalas Newton's laws, I'll take a short break so we can head to the restroom and everything else, and then we'll continue with the rest of the A unit. Newton Rogal Abkarib Saraha, Uhtara rules Ktira Giddan 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 Giddan. Bess Ehman Atam two of his laws. Hagasma Newton's first law, Newton's second law of motion. Newton's laws of motion describe what happens. To the movement of an object, the yani movement as in speed or direction, if a force is applied on it. For the first law is very simple. Be an object will always remain at rest. 
okay? Or stay in a constant state of motion. Yeah, constant state of motion, a constant speed. Unless acted on by a resultant A force. Targama uh, Morsi, لو سمحت. Well, المش مهم statement, المهم cases. Case number one. عندي عربية ماشية لقدام. Okay? لو الفورس اللي عليها برضو لقدام, the speed of this car will increase. So, بكل بساطة, في force, speed increases, يعني في acceleration. طب افرض لو العربية ماشية لقدام, but the resultant force is backwards, يعني less brakes ولا حاجة. If the force is backwards, again, if the force is backwards and the car is moving forward, the speed will decrease. هو مش هيرجع لورا. It's already, it already has a forward speed. يا جماعة. In order to move back, it has to slow down first. فتاني, if the force is opposite to the direction of motion, you slow down. If the force is with the direction of motion, you speed A up. طب again, افرد لو الابجكت مشي لقدام, عربية دي مشي لقدام, والفورس جت بالجنب. It's not forward and it's not a backwards, it's sideways. It changes a direction. So a force can do the following. It can either speed up your car, slow down your object, or change its direction of a motion, depending on if it's in the direction of the force, opposite to the direction of the force, or sideways, perpendicular to the direction of the force. The more important cases هم الاخرين دول اخر اثنين دول دول مهمين قوي if the force on this object is zero يعني if this object is at rest العربيه دي واقفه and the force on it is zero يعني في اه فورس قدام ورا but they cancel each other out because they're perfectly equal the object stays at rest okay However, and this is the most important case, if the object is already moving forward and the force acting on it is zero, and if you force it with them, if you force it with but they cancel each other A out because they're equal, and the resultant force is zero, the object moves at a constant speed and direction. And this is the most important part of Newton's First law, because the lip time lachbata ktiir. Guys, an object does not continue to move because it uh, has a force. An object continues to move even without a force. Well, the force is zero. The speed la had zid, well la had a had l. Where's my pointer? Oh, there it is. The speed la had zid, well had l. So if the speed is not increasing, and if the speed is not decreasing, it does not stop. It just keeps moving a. Forever. What does it when you're really driving a car? When you're in a car and you're moving quickly, it's a force on them. It's a driving force on the engine. And it's a force on the water, which is air resistance. Yani you need to realize, and when you're moving, there is actually a resisting force acting on you. So when you're in a car and it's moving at a constant speed, that's because it's a force on the water, it's a force on the speed, it's a force on the water, it's a force on the water, it's a force on the water. So the speed is equal. The speed will neither increase or decrease. You move at a constant speed. If you stop pressing the gas pedal, يعني شيل تريلي مع بنزين. كده الفورس اللي بتزق القدام راحت بس ال air resistance is still موجودة. So technically, انت بترجع على case D. And when you're not pressing your gas pedal, you're not balancing out the air resistance. So that's why your speed decreases. Okay. Excellent. Now, حتى الأخيرة دي. In uh, year, uh, year 10 bus, it's not for year 9. Newton's second law is simply an equation to F equals ma. But only a couple of things. First, the only force and acceleration are directly proportional, meaning the force is z, the acceleration is z. And it kind of makes sense. So the benzene octor and accelerate octor. But more importantly, it shows me that mass and acceleration are inversely proportional. And the kind of mass z, the acceleration t l. This also makes sense because. كل من الأوبجكت يبقى عندها ماس أكتر it becomes harder to move صعب إن أنا أغير الموشن بتاعتها so please keep that in mind F دي فورس وبيتقاس بين نيوتن ال M دي ماس لازم تكون بكيلوجرام it must be in kilograms A is acceleration and it must be in meters per second square so here's a quick example بيقول لي a resultant force of 4500 newtons so مديني force is acting on a 900 kilogram car okay in its direction of motion يعني it's accelerating Calculate the A acceleration. Fail. F equals M A. Yeah, this means A equals F over M. The force became well forty five hundred 
over mass be 900 that plug them into my trusty calculator should be 5 exactly so the acceleration here is 5 meters per second squared and that's that okay so uh, everybody uh, who's watching I'm going to take a short break because uh, personally I kind of need the restroom so we're going on break for a few minutes laws of a motion now continue last couple of things we want to talk about when it comes to movement is what happens when objects fall well, obviously they fall because all objects experience a force called gravity or the full of gravity weight now how it falls kind of depends on if it's falling in a vacuum as in if we're ignoring air resistance or not if you have an object that's falling in a vacuum there is only weight acting on it this causes the object to fall at a constant acceleration always now because there is only weight and it doesn't really matter what the object is if it's big if it's small if it's light if it's heavy as long as there is no air resistance and the only force acting on it is its weight it falls at a constant acceleration okay cool whereas if it's falling in air the size back kind of matters the size and weight matter if i am dropping an object with a certain weight, let's say 10 newtons or so, and another object of equal weight but larger area, this experiences more air resistance than the other object. Which means that if I drop them both and I have them fall to the ground, the object on the left reaches the floor first and this falls next second. However, if we're comparing objects of different weights in air, but same size. So if this is a 10 newton object and this is just the same size, but it's much heavier, let's say it's 50 newtons or so. So they have the exact same weight. However, uh, sorry, the exact same area, but different weight. This has a much larger weight. This means they have the same air resistance. So the one that's going to drop first would be the 50 newton ball. This drops first and this reaches the ground second. Okay, that's quite simple actually. But more importantly, we want to talk about something called terminal velocity. Now, what is terminal velocity? Terminal velocity is when an object is falling through air and air resistance acts on it. Eventually, it reaches a constant speed as it falls. And that constant speed is called terminal velocity. But let's see why. Let's say this is Mr. U. See, I told you he'd be back. So Mr. U here has a weight of 500 newtons. He's pretty light. And as soon as he jumps out of the airplane so he can go skydiving, there's only one force on him, the 500 newtons. So he has a specific acceleration, which is 10. This is the acceleration caused by gravity. But as he falls, we have the experience right air resistance. Now, just a bit, but his force is still 500 newtons with 100 newtons worth of air resistance, for example. For this means that the resultant force, Ilali, the force has now decreased. It's now 400 newtons. And if the force decreases, the acceleration of Mr. U also decreases. It's less than 10. Okay, so wait, but here's the thing. Air resistance is not going to be a constant 100. It's going to gradually increase, increase, increase over time. This means that the resultant force will also gradually decrease, decrease, decrease over time. Which means acceleration decreases over time. Eventually, and this is the important bit, the air resistance acting on Mr. U is going to be equal to the weight acting on Mr. U. So if air resistance, oops, uh, let's erase that. If the air resistance and weight acting on Mr. U are now equal, let's call this AR, and weight are equal, the resultant force is zero. And what did we just say about things that are moving with a constant force of zero? We simply say that they move with no acceleration or constant speed. So they fall at constant speed. This constant speed is called terminal velocity. So what is terminal velocity? It's the constant speed that a falling object reaches when 
the air resistance and weight are equal to each other. This means that the resultant force and acceleration are both zero. Now, as a special case, if you are currently falling at your terminal velocity or just falling in general, and you just suddenly open a parachute, what this causes is that causes the air resistance to spike up. It increases more than your weight. Let's say it reaches a thousand newtons. But remember, you are moving down. Your direction of motion is down. So you don't go up with the parachute. You just slow down or you decelerate. of Newton's A first law. When the force is opposite to your direction of motion, you slow down. So when the force is opposite to your direction of motion, in this case, you slow down. And that's what the parachute does. That's why it's important, because if you don't slow down, you're going to die. And Mr. E doesn't want to die. Nobody wants to die. Anyway, <laughs> dark jokes aside, moving on. This last minor detail is for year nine, uh, not for year nines, and for the next five minutes or so, you're gonna, th this stuff is not for year nine, okay? At Laos sine d4, we're going to talk about circular motion, momentum, and we're going to solve a couple of examples for momentum. So all of this is not for year nine. This is going to be take me about five minutes or so. So uh, feel free to take your own break in year nines until I'm back. Circular motion. What is circular motion? An object is moving in a circle. Totally. What's special about it? Well, nothing really. I mean, honestly, it's not worth mentioning much, except that if an object is moving in a circle, it's changing direction, right? Great. If it's changing direction, let's just write this down, direction. This means that something else is also changing. It's also changing velocity. Because remember, velocity is speed, but with a direction. So if the direction changes, the velocity changes. Great. Well, if the velocity changes, doesn't that mean that the object is accelerating? If it's moving in a circle? Because remember, what is acceleration? Acceleration is defined as the change in velocity over time. Sure, there's no change in value. Yeah, I could be moving to the right at a speed of 10 meters per second. And now moving at an angle this way at 10 meters per second. So the value of the speed hasn't changed. But if the direction changes, we still call this acceleration. Now, according to Newton's first and second law, if there is a force, there must be acceleration. So the opposite applies. If an object is accelerating, there must be a force causing the change in direction. And if you recall, the direction of this force is sideways because it's changing direction. But here's the thing, it's always sideways and towards the center of that circle. This is the direction of the resultant force. If an object is moving in a circle, the force is always towards the center of the circle. This means that if the car reaches this point, the force is also to the center. If the car eventually reaches this point, the force is still to the center. Okay? Great. Now, if you start to move in the circle and you start to move really fast, sometimes this force, this resultant force, will not be able to keep you in that circle. So if you're moving too fast or if the object that you're, that's currently moving is very heavy, like a big container truck, the delivery truck, and it moves really fast, it will eventually have to leave the circle because this force is not strong enough to keep changing its direction. When an object leaves a circle, it always leaves the circle tangent to the point where it left. So if the car is moving this way, this way, this way, tiki henna, it leaves, it moves in a straight line, tangent to the circle. Had it kept going, it would leave this point, for example, it would move in a straight line here, and so on. So that's easy enough. Now, let's talk about momentum. Uh, some people find momentum confusing. Momentum is actually really easy because it's basically just mass times velocity. That's, that's all we care about. It's, it's kind of like energy. When you have kinetic energy and you're moving, and if you're not moving, you don't have it. Same thing. Momentum is a quantity, is something that you have if you're moving. If you're not moving, you don't have momentum. Momentum is mass times velocity. So the faster you're moving, the more momentum you have. The slower you're moving, the less momentum you have. But it doesn't only depend on velocity. It also depends on mass. So the more mass you have, the more momentum you have. So um, an object that's big and heavy. How about this? Think of bowling. If I decide to go bowling, this is, I'm going to use this example a lot, and we have a few bowling pins. I'm not going to draw all the bowling pins. Let's just say this is a bowling pin. 
amongst a lot of others. If I have a bowling ball, a really big, heavy bowling ball that has a mass of 10 kilograms, and I have a tennis ball, a small tennis ball, that has a mass of, I don't know, at most uh, half a kilogram, but let's say 0.25 kilograms, it's a quarter of a kilogram, and they're both moving at the same speed, which one is going to hit the pin harder? Obviously, the bigger one. Because it's not just about how fast you're moving. It's also about how heavy you are. So Newton took both of these together and joined them together to create this quantity called momentum. So momentum is just mass times velocity. The unit's either kilogram meters per second or it's just Newton seconds. Just memorize the quantity as it is. Now momentum is important because, as I just said, if you have more momentum, when you hit something, you're going to hit it harder. So the force during a collision or the force caused by the collision is affected by momentum. I would actually say that force is actually defined as the rate of change in momentum, as in the change in momentum per unit time, how much change in momentum has happened over time. How about this? Let's, let's solve a quick example. Let's say that this 10 kilogram bowling ball is going forward and it's going to hit the pin. This bowling ball after it uh, is currently moving at the speed of 10 meters per second. So this is going to be an easy number. And it stops. And it hits the pin and the pin just goes flying. Phew. Okay. That's not important. What I want to find out is what is the force applied by the bowling ball on the pin? To do that, we need one more quantity. The collision only took us 0.1 seconds. And when the balling ball hit the pin, it only took 0.1 seconds. So let's calculate the force. So we say force equals change in momentum. What is the momentum though? Momentum of the ball is 10 kilograms times 10 meters per second. Mass times velocity. There's no other change in velocity, so it's just 10. Over, what's the time? 0.1. This will give you a thousand newtons. And this is why the bowling pin just goes bam, just disappears, flies off. Because the bowling ball has a lot of momentum. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Excellent. So that's what momentum means, and that's how momentum applies a force. Now, as an extra quantity, there's a quantity called impulse. You know, when you, uh, I don't know, punch someone, or you play golf, or you play tennis, whenever there's a force that's applied in a very short amount of time, you, like, smack something, slap it, punch it, do whatever. That collision, that smack, has a name, and we called it impulse. It comes from the word pulse, so it's kind of clear. Impulse is basically force times time, like when you apply a force on an object in a very short amount of time. Okay? But it turns out that impulse actually means change in momentum. Now, let's see the math here, just a second. If I say impulse is force times time, don't forget that force already equals momentum over time, or change in momentum over time, delta. Wait, force times time, here's force and here's time. If time goes up, this means that force times time is change in momentum. So plug this in here, you end up with impulse, being equals to the change in momentum. And that's what it actually means, because when you hit something, like a bowling ball or a tennis ball, or you play golf or something, or you punch someone, you change their momentum, you cause them to move. Capish? Cool. Let's use these equations in a quick example. It says, a driver accelerates gently so that the force of 30 newtons acts on a 900 kilogram car. That's a really weak force for 10 seconds. So he gave me the force, he gave me the mass, and he gave me the time. Calculate the impulse of the force. Now, impulse is quite simple. He gave me force and time. That's all I need. So impulse is force times time. So it's 30 times 10, which is 300. Uh, Newton, second. Newton time second, not Newton per second, okay? Now that we have the impulse, he wants, what's the change in velocity due to that impulse? Now, if you remember, we also said that impulse is equal to the change in momentum acting on an object, all right? 
we already have the mass, which means we can find the velocity. So we can say that the change in velocity is equal to the impulse over the mass. So 300 newton second divided by 900. So 3 over 9 is 1 over 3, but 0 0.33 meters per second. You just basically substitute stuff, and that's all. Good. Now, the last thing we want to talk about when it comes to momentum is something called the law of conservation of momentum. This works whenever two different objects are moving and they collide with each other. And for example, if I have a bowling ball and another bowling ball, if one of them is moving and the other is stationary, eventually when they hit each other, bam, uh, you can have many different cases. These objects could, uh, for example, the first ball would stop and the second ball would move. The first ball would rebound back and the second ball would move forward. Or maybe both of the balls just, you know, stick close to each other and they move together as if they were one object. This is what usually happens during a collision. And turns out that collisions follow one very basic rule, that the total momentum of the objects before the collision must be equal to the total momentum after the collision. Total momentum before equals total momentum after. This allows us to calculate the speeds at which they you know, rebound or move together after the collision. Because we already know the masses, but we kind of need to know the speeds. Let's apply this right away. Uh, this example says a tennis ball of mass 0.25 is moving at 20 meters per second. So he gave me a tennis ball. We know the mass. And it's moving at a speed of 20. And it hits a stationary ping pong ball. So we have a smaller ball. And it's stationary, meaning it's at rest. And it has a mass of 0.025 kilogram. Cool. So now we know what's going on before the collision. This tennis ball is moving. And it's going to hit this smaller ball. After the collision, the balls stick together. Oh, okay, cool. So after they collide, they kind of join together. That means they move together as if they were one object. This also move, means that the total mass of the object is not 0.25 and it's not 0.025. The total mass of the object is going to be 0.25 plus 0.025, which is 0.275. So now we have the mass. What does he want about? Calculate the momentum of the tennis ball before the collision. Now, momentum is easy. Momentum equals mass times velocity. So 0.25 times 20. Now, on your calculator, it gives us 5. Oh, Robert 25. That makes sense. Okay, cool. So now I have the momentum. 5 kilograms meter per second. What does he want next? He wants the uh, the speed of the balls after the collision. Then the speed of the balls after the collision. So wait a minute. Why did he say that? Because remember the balls join together. So we assume they're one ball, and they have a certain speed. And we just said that total momentum before equals total momentum after. So before it's five, after it's supposed to be a total of five. So let's calculate the momentum here. We say m v which is mass times velocity, so 0.275 times v, which I don't know. But since the total momentum before and after are the same, I could just say 5 equals 0.275 times v, because that's the momentum before, that's the momentum after. This leaves us with v being equal to 5 divided by 0.275. Five. Forgive my absolutely horrendous handwriting. Maybe <laughs> 18.2 meters per second. Okay, great. That's how you use the law of conservation of momentum. Momentum before equals momentum after. Taking a quick look at the chat. Okay, cool. Okay, year nine. Come back.
Excellent. So let's continue. Next up, a hook slot. This one is super simple. Uh, here's a spring. A spring has what we call an original length. After you apply a force on it, it stretches and the length increases. We call this the total length or the stretch length. The springs always follow one very basic law called Hooke's law, and it states that the extension of a spring is directly proportional to the load acting on the spring. What does that mean? This means that if I keep increasing the force, it'll get longer, but the extension, which is the difference between these two lengths, it's called the extension x, is directly proportional to the force. So if the force increases, the extension increases. If the force decreases, the extension decreases. If the force is zero, the extension is also zero. But that's as long as we do not cross what we call the elastic limit. The elastic limit is kind of like the maximum force that the spring can handle before it does not go back to its original shape. Because here's the idea. If you stretch a spring using a force with your hands or just hanging a load, it'll increase in length. That's cool. But if you remove the force, it's supposed to go back to its original length. And that's what usually happens. However, this will not happen if you go beyond the limit. The limit is just a maximum force after which the spring kind of gets permanently ruined. Now, if you take what we just said and we plot it on a graph, the graph would kind of look like this. If we have force on the y-axis and the extension on the x-axis, you would end up with a line that is straight. Just a nice, long, straight line. Until you reach the elastic limit. Let's say this is your limit. After the limit, it no longer becomes proportional. Just to show you that it's no longer obeying Hooke's law, the line ends up curving. Okay? And it always curves in the same direction as the extension because what happens after the limit, the spring becomes permanently deformed. And it becomes weaker, so it extends more. This is why it curves to the right. Okay? It always curves. In the same direction as the extension. And that's fabulous. Not really. You really don't want this to happen. So, so that's basically Hooke's law. Uh, year 10, when we have just a small equation where we change the force is proportional to extension to force equals spring constant times extension. Spring constant represents how strong or stiff a spring is. Okay? If you want to get it, just make it the subject in this equation, where k equals f over x, and you can calculate it using any force and extension given to you in the question. Next up, uh, let's talk about pressure. Pressure is quite simple. It's defined as the force per unit area. This means that when you apply a force on an object, the area over which the force acts is kind of important. If the area is small, the pressure is very high, which causes an object to break through or cut through. The surface it's on. And this is very evident when we talk about things like, you know, screws and nails. When a nail has a very small area, contact area, this space over here, and you apply a force on it, all of that force is focused at that point. And that focusing of the force is what we call pressure. If the area decreases, pressure increases. And vice versa. If, uh, if I have a large area, like a block, an object with the same force, but it has a large surface area. And you apply the exact same force, you get a much lower pressure because it's spread out over a much larger area. The unit of measurement of pressure is called Pascal. That's pretty much it. Now, when it comes to liquids, however, pressure in liquids isn't really calculate using force over area. He could have you calculate it using force over area, literally by giving you a force and an area. But uh, we don't do that. Instead, the pressure in the liquid depends on two quantities. The depth of the liquid, how deep the liquid is, and the density. If you have a certain amount of liquid, let's call this, uh, let's say this is water, and there's a certain depth h. If you double the depth, like if you increase the depth of the water, the pressure on the bottom of the container caused by the water increases. Okay? That's because as the height increases, the pressure A increases. However, 
if you got a different liquid like oil, which has a lower density, the density is less, this will apply less pressure because pressure is proportional to the density of the liquid. So the more dense a liquid is, the more pressure it applies. The less dense a liquid is, the less pressure it applies. Same thing with depth. Now finally, and this is not for your nines, uh, this rule is what we use to calculate pressure in a liquid. We say rho, which is density, g, which is 10, and h, which is the depth or the height, to calculate the pressure in a liquid. Okay? As a minor point, when you go diving underwater, you experience pressure due to two sources, not just the liquid. You experience pressure due to the liquid, but you also experience pressure due to the atmosphere because the air itself applies pressure on the surface of the liquid. We call this atmospheric pressure. And this pressure, along with the liquid, are all applied on your body. So if I were to tell you, for example, that atmospheric pressure is, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, 100,000 pascal, which is the unit of pressure. And I tell you the pressure of the liquid is uh, 10,000. 50,000 pascal. And I ask you, what's the total pressure on the diver over here? We would say the total pressure is 100,000 plus 50,000, which is 150,000 pascal. So the pressure acting on an object underwater is not only due to the water, it's also due to the air above it, the atmosphere above it. Okay? Great. Uh, finally, when it comes to pressure, we have two measuring instruments called the manometer and the barometer. The barometer is an instrument that measures pressure difference. So it's basically, it's just a tube in the shape of a U, and it's open on two ends, uh, on both of these ends. We have two sources of pressure coming in. Sometimes it's just atmospheric pressure, just air. So if you have two pressures and the levels of the liquid are the same, we say that the pressures are also the same. But if one side drops down, and the other side goes up. This means that the pressures going into both of these tubes are not equal anymore. If this side goes down more and this side goes up, we say that the pressure of the second is greater than the first. The pressure on the second side or the right-hand side of the tube is greater than the first. This height that I'm drawing over here, this represents the pressure difference. This represents how greater or smaller the pressure is than the other side. So if I tell you that this height is 10 centimeters, I would simply say that pressure two is greater than pressure one by 10 centimeters, or pressure two is equal to pressure one plus 10 centimeters of pressure due to this A liquid. So the barometer just gets you the pressure A difference, okay? The manometer, on the other hand, measures a specific type of pressure called the atmospheric pressure, which is the pressure of the air or the atmosphere. This only works with the following setup. First, you get a tube, a very long tube. You get a dish, and this dish must be full of mercury. It only works with mercury because it's very dense. And this upside-down tube must have a vacuum in this upper space. It should be no air at all. The liquid will always sit up at a specific height. This height represents the atmospheric pressure. If the atmospheric pressure increases, it pushes the liquid and dish down further, and it pushes the liquid inside up further, so this height increases. So if the pressure increases, the height on the barometer also increases. And obviously if the atmospheric pressure, and when I say atmospheric, I mean the air around us decreases, if the pressure decreases, the height also decreases. And that's the difference between the barometer and the manometer. So the barometer measures pressure difference. The manometer measures the atmospheric pressure, or the pressure of the air around us. Excellent. So, uh, quick look. How do we make the space a vacuum? Basically, what we do is we fill up the tube when it's not upside down, and then we flip it over really fast. And when we flip it over really fast, it drops down. Uh, leaving a vacuum in the space above. Okay. Cool. So let's move on and let's continue. 
Next up, uh, let's talk about moments. We only have two topics to talk about, moments and energy. And let's be done with this, yalla. What is a moment? A moment is defined as the turning effect of a force. If you apply a force on an object and there is a pivot, pivot is basically a point that's fixed over here. If you apply a force on an object and there's a pivot, the object turns or it rotates. This rotation is called a moment. This rotation is called a moment. So the moment is nothing more than how strong an object turns. It's calculated simply by using force times perpendicular distance from the pivot. Which distance? If this is the force that we're talking about over here, the distance from the pivot to the force so that this line is perpendicular to the force, this is the distance we use. So it's basically force times distance. Please be careful. It's the distance to the pivot. Some of the questions that we'll see uh, loves to trick you when it comes to the distance by splitting up the distance midway by marking different points if I want the moment of a specific force it has to be the distance from that force to the pivot okay cool now there are two different types of moments because a moment has a direction it's a vector quantity it has a direction and the direction of a moment should be either this way which we call a clockwise direction, or it could be this way, which is the anti-clockwise direction. So it's either clockwise or anti-clockwise. Sometimes you'll have even more than one moment, so we have to calculate the resultant moment, and that's what we'll see now. Now, what is the term equilibrium? Equilibrium is a term that represents the fact that an object is love perfectly balanced. Or maybe it's steady. Or maybe it's held. Or maybe it's not moving. But there are two conditions for an object to be in equilibrium. It, the resultant force should be zero, meaning if there are any other forces on the object, they should cancel each other out, like left and right cancel each other out. And they should be equal, or up and down should be equal. And the resultant moment should be zero. This means that if an object is experiencing a moment, the clockwise moment should be equal to the anti-clockwise moment. These should be equal. And we'll see an application of this right now. For an example, Yoli, the image shows a beam in equilibrium. Like right now, I'm telling, you, I'm telling you this beam is in equilibrium. F is the force of an unknown load. Okay, cool. Mysterious. R is the force of the pivot on the beam. Because remember, the pivot is still a solid object. It's in contact with the ruler or whatever this is. So it also applies a force. Using the information in the image, calculate the value of F and calculate the value of R. Now, before I talk about this question, just a really quick thing. The moment of R is zero. Danny, the moment caused by R is zero because R is at the pivot. When a force is at the pivot, when a force is at the pivot itself, <clears throat> Sorry. It does not apply a moment because the distance between it and the pivot is zero. So there is no moment. So R doesn't have a moment. So I'm not going to look at that for now. F, however, applies a clockwise moment. And uh, the 100 newtons applies an anti clockwise moment. So to first solve this, we have to solve it using moments. If the clockwise moment Let's call it just clock M equals the anti-clockwise moment. So let's just call it anti M. The clockwise moment is force times distance. F times the distance from the pivot to the F, which is 0 0.2. So we're going to say F times 0 0.2. Okay. And then 100 newtons is the anti-clockwise moment. So 100 newtons times 0 0.5. That's the distance. So 100 times 0 0.5. If you calculate this stuff, you will end up with 100 times 0.5 divided by 0.2. This gives you 250 newtons. And this is how we use moments to calculate a specific type of force. And it's quite simple, actually. Now, I want you to notice the value of this force. This value is 250 newtons. It's really large. That's because when things are balanced, 
and you have multiple forces, if the forces are at the same distance from each other, they should be the same force. But if they're different distances from each other, like this example over here, force pivot, every time as if it's closer to the pivot than the other force, it's much larger. And if the force is far away, it's much smaller. That's how they balance. But we didn't finish answering the question because part B says, what's R? Well, if this object is in equilibrium, this means that the total upward force should be equal to the total downward force. Remember, resultant moment is zero. We already used that. And resultant force should also be zero. This means the total upward should be equal to total downwards. And we've kind of already solved this because if the force down here is 250 newtons and over here it's 100, this means the total downward force is 350. This means that R, the total upward force, should also be equal to 350. So it can balance the upwards and downward forces together. So part B is going to be 350, which is 250 plus 100. Do not look at them as if they're left and right. They are pointing down. They are not pointing left and right. So when it comes to forces, you take a look at their current direction, up or down. Okay? So R is 350 newtons A upwards. Because that's what balances these two. Finally, the last thing we want to talk about when it comes to moments is an idea called stability. But to talk about it, we have to mention what center of mass is first. The center of mass is nothing more than a point in an object, all right, where we consider weight to act. This is where gravity pulls an object down. Okay, so center of mass is the point inside an object where it pulls an object A down. It always acts at the center of the object. If it's a regular shape, However, if it's an irregular shape, it cannot be here. It cannot be in the center. That's because, you know, it's not really the center of the mass. This side is heavier than this. Center of mass is always in the heavier side of the object if it's not uh, a uniform shape. Okay? Yeah. Now, stability is simply the ability of an object to not fall over. So the question is, what makes an object fall? Or, you know, if we go Dark Knight and say, I was like, why do we fall, Bruce? So we can stand back up again. Ah, that's a Dark Knight reference. Anyway, or Batman reference, anyway. So, right now, this first bottle is currently standing still. And the weight of the object of the bottle is just pulling it down, slatting the surface, no biggie. But when you tilt the object just a little bit, and the weight is still pulling it down, this time, it's kind of trying to balance itself on this end, which we will call the pivot for now. Since the weight of the bottle is on the left side, this creates an anti-clockwise moment, so it falls back. Boom, and it just stands back. But if you tilt it way too much, so that the center of mass is now on the other side of the edge of the object, the other side of the pivot, it now creates a clockwise moment, which makes the object smack fall to the ground. So why does an object fall, or how does an object fall? It falls when the center of mass crosses the edge of said object. So obviously, anything that affects the center of mass, or affects where the edge is going to be, will affect stability. You can increase the stability by either lowering the center of mass, and getting an object that is heavier on the bottom side. Maybe you add a few weights down here. Maybe the object is originally short in the first place. Or you can increase the center of mass by increasing the width of the base. Like instead of getting a thin bottle, maybe you get a wider bottle. So an object is more stable when it's wide and low because the center of mass is low. This is more stable. Whereas an object is less stable when it's narrow and super high because you know it has a lower base, narrower base, and a higher center of A mass. It's less stable. Okay, great. Uh, one last look at questions before I move on to energy. Omar, uh, chillax. Okay, anything else? Uh, some air may leak from the manometer. Do you, do you mean the barometer? Uh, yes, you can touch with the air from the tube of the manometer, Yusuf, yes. Some air may leak from the manometer, not really. I mean, you can't have leaks from a manometer, basically. 
from a barometer it can't leak unless you accidentally break uh, yeah, break the barometer. The one with the mercury is called the barometer, not a manometer. Okay, and no, the air cannot leak from the inside. Okay, let's continue. Now, the last thing I want to discuss today is energy. Now, energy is something that we all have, something that I'm currently running out of, and I would love to rest and eat so I can replenish some of my energy. But energy is something that we need in order to perform different types of actions and, or other devices to work. Like this laptop right now is working off of electrical energy. I'm speaking, so I'm giving out sound energy. I've got a light bulb on, so there's light energy. Uh, you know, if I decide to go running or jogging, I have kinetic energy. So energy kind of represents the different states uh, that we're currently in, whether you're moving or you're climbing or something is lit up on fire. You know, if Mr. U is set on fire, we say that he's currently emitting thermal energy. He's, he's pretty hot, actually. So, uh, <laughs> okay, jokes aside, we have different types of energy. The first is kinetic. Kinetic is quite simple. It's the energy of movement. So if you're moving faster, you have more kinetic energy. This doesn't really need much explanation. Uh, to the year 10 students, this is the equation we used to calculate kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is half mv squared. Okay, half m v squared mass times velocity squared. Gravitational energy or gravitational potential energy is the energy stored in an object when it is raised up like when you lift an object up against gravity or when you climb up a ladder or something, we say you now gain or have gravitational potential energy. Okay? So it's just energy stored inside an object when it's raised up. Now, it depends on the height and it also depends on the mass because if I have an object that's heavier, it has more mass, we say it has more gravitational potential energy simply because, you know, it's, it has more mass. It took us more effort to lift it up. Chemical energy is the energy stored inside food or fuel, like coal or oil or gas or such, or in batteries. These all have chemical energy within them. Strain energy is the energy stored inside an object when it is, uh, you know, bent, like when you bend an object or when you have a spring and you stretch the spring. So the more you stretch it, the more strain energy it stores inside. Thermal is just heat, and we already took an entire unit for that. Nuclear, and that's what I'm going to talk about, is the energy stored inside the nucleus of an atom. Stored inside the nucleus of an atom. Now, we have two nuclear reactions that we make use of to take advantage of nuclear energy. The first reaction is called nuclear fission. And this is what we use in our power stations. What happens in nuclear fission, because the word fission means to break, is that we get a nucleus and we break it into two smaller pieces. When we break any nucleus, usually it's uranium, but when you break a nucleus into smaller nuclei, it releases a lot of energy in the form of heat and light. And this is what our nuclear bombs are made of and you know power stations work. So fission is when you break or split a nucleus into two smaller nuclei. Fusion, nuclear fusion, is another reaction, but that happens only in the sun. And the sun doesn't like to break stuff, it likes to create. So it takes two smaller nuclei, smashes them together to form a bigger nucleus, which also releases heat and a light. This is why we see a lot of heat and light coming from the sun, not because it's burning, but because it's busy creating a nuclear fusion reaction. It's just joining elements together. Okay, cool. So uh, finally, we have light, sound, and electricity. We, you already are familiar with these types of energy. We discussed them in waves before. Energy follows one very simple but important law called the law of conservation of energy. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. Uh, this means that when I'm speaking right now, I'm giving out sound energy. Okay. And the energy I'm giving out has to be consumed from somewhere else. In this case, it's from my body. So when I'm speaking, I'm converting chemical energy into sound. Uh, when I have a light bulb, I, it converts electrical energy into light and heat. When I'm running, I'm converting chemical energy into kinetic energy, sometimes some heat. So you have to be familiar with the different types of energy so you can talk about how they change, okay? And so that your device doesn't die.
Okay. Excellent too. So what were we saying? Yes. We finished talking about the law of conservation of energy. But uh, before we move on to the different types uh, to energy work and uh, work power and efficiency, here's a quick example using the equations for kinetic and potential energy, not for you and I. Uh, in this question, it says a cyclist pedals up a hill. Her mass is 90 kilograms, and she rides down the hill without pedaling or using the brakes. So we have the height, which is 10 meters, and her mass, which is 90. Her gravity, calculate her gravitational potential energy at the top of the hill. Now, this is easy. Gravitational potential energy is equal to mg h, which is 90 times 10 times 10 in this particular case, which gives us 900 joules. So we got it. Next, back. calculate her maximum speed at the bottom of the hill. Assume no friction or resistance. Now, please note, when she's going down the hill, all of her gravitational potential energy should change to Kinetic energy, assuming that there's no energy lost as heat due to friction or air resistance. So this means that the gravitational potential energy she had at the top is equal to the kinetic energy she has at the bottom. Now the gravitational potential energy is already 900 joules, but the kinetic energy has the following equation, half m v squared, v power 2. We already have the m, so substitute this again to 900 equals half times 90 times v power 2. And now we want to calculate the velocity. So just rearrange your equations. You end up with uh, half of 90 45. So 900 divided by 45. I can square root the answer the height. So let me just plug that in. 900 divided by 45. 20 divide, square root your answer. 4.47 meters per second so that's how you get the velocity not the velocity squared okay that's how you get the velocity this is a very common type of question yes uh, please notice the gravitation kinetic i could give you the reverse i could give you kinetic or like hatli height which means kinetic it how will the potential if you're throwing something up okay cool next we have three very important quantities when it comes to energy work power and efficiency Work is quite simple. When you apply a force on any object, like a box, and the object moves a certain distance, this force moving a certain distance gives energy to the box in order to move it. We call this transfer of energy work. The transfer of energy is called work. It's calculated quite simply by using energy is equal to force times distance. The force times distance. But here's the thing. This distance must be parallel to the force. So if the force is pushing it to the side, the distance should also be sideways. If I'm lifting an object up, you bet the distance has to be vertical. In this case, it's the height. Okay? Done. Next, we'll solve an example for this just in a bit. The unit of measurement of uh, work is in joules, and the unit of measurement of energy in general is also a joules. Next up, power. Power is defined as the rate of transfer of energy, or how much energy you do over time. It's as in how fast are you doing your work. So if you have two people at the gym, like myself, for example, and you have Mr. Yu. And we're both working out and we're lifting weights. Even if we're lifting the same weight, but Mr. Yu does it faster, like he takes less time, whereas I do it slower because you know, we're trapped at home. So if I take more time, this means that I have less power. I'm less powerful. Whereas Mr. U takes less time, so it means he's more a powerful. We simply calculate power using energy over time. And the unit of measurement of power is what? Okay. Finally, what is efficiency? The idea of efficiency is this. If you have any device, such as this light bulb, this device takes in a certain source of energy, let's say electrical energy, and gives me two other types of energy. In this case, it's light and heat. But here's the question. The total energy before should be equal to the total energy or power after. But that does not mean that the total energy that it's given me or it's converted to is useful. For example, let's say this light bulb takes in 100 watts of electricity. 
and only gives me 10 watts of light. This means it gives me 90 watts of heat. The problem is this is considered, uh, let's change the color, this is considered wasted energy. Energy Why the hell do I even want 90 watts of heat? I'm paying money, 100 watts worth of money, so I can only get 10 watts of electricity or light? Why? So no, we see that this light bulb has a very low efficiency. To calculate the efficiency, it's quite easy. You just take in the useful output that you actually got over the total input times 100. It's a percentage. So 10 divided by 100 times 100 gives you an efficiency of 10%. This thing is terrible. It only gives you 10% of your energy back is in the form of useful energy. When something is efficient, however, as in when it has a high efficiency, this has a low efficiency, this means it wastes less. And if I repeat this same example, but with a different light bulb, let's say it doesn't waste uh 90 watts of uh, heat let's say it wastes one watt of heat but it still gives me 10 watts of light this means it doesn't really take or consume 100 watts of electricity what it actually consumes is 11 watts in total so if i were to calculate the efficiency again i would say 10 watts because that's the useful divide by 11 that's the total times 100 this will give me a percentage of, let's pull out our trusty calculator. This would give me an efficiency of 91%. This means 91% of my energy is useful. Okay, excellent. Now, here's a quick example using work and power. First, he says a heavy crate is pushed 12 meters, so he gave me the distance, along a horizontal floor against the 30 Newton frictional force. So he gave me the force that we're working against in six seconds, and he pushed it in a time of six seconds. He's basically giving me everything. First, calculate the work done against friction. So, okay, work or energy is equal to force times distance. What's the force? Uh, 30 Newtons times the distance, which is 12 over here. 30 times 12 would give us da, 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 360, 360 joules. Okay? Cool. Now we've gotten the work, but what, does, what else does he want? He also wants the power. Power is basically this. Power is the how much energy you transfer per second. And we already know how much energy we transferred when we pushed that box, it's 360. Over, how much time does it take? Six seconds. So 360 divided by six seconds would give me a power of 60 watt. This means that I'm developing 60 joules of energy per second, or I'm using up 60 joules of energy per second. That's basically it. So that's how you use the equations, it's quite simple. Quick look, how do you make uh, something more efficient? By decreasing the amount of energy that is lost. Okay, Amr? Uh, usually we try to fix the device so that it wastes less, so it makes it more efficient. Uh, thank you, I'm stronger than this to you. Uh, 90 times 10. Oh, yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's uh, 9,000. Thank you, Yazid. Uh, yes, it's 9,000. Of course, it's Thank you, Yazid. I did make a mistake when I was calculating that. So let's. Uh, Go back and fix that really quick. Where was the example? Here we go. Yes, there's an extra zero missing here. My mistake. So when we calculate this, it should end up being... Fourteen. The answer here is not four. The answer here is 14.1 meters per second. Thank you, Ziad, for pointing that out. Okay.
Oh yeah, out of power, definitely out of power and energy. Okay, Christ. Uh, okay, excellent. Now the last thing we're going to talk about would be the different types of power stations we have. A chapter. Now. The last thing we want to talk about are power stations, and a power station is nothing more than a facility that converts some kind of energy into electrical energy, and the target is to generate electricity. We have many different power stations, but before that we have two specific types or categories of sources. We call them renewable and non-renewable sources of energy. Renewable sources of energy are things that don't end, things like sunlight and wind and water waves and just water in general, geothermal, or even if you use them, they come back really quickly. So that's why we call them renewable. Non-renewable sources are finite sources of energy like coal or oil or gas, or because when you burn these things, they are lost for good. And even though the earth, because of, you know, all of the older or no, newer, sorry, plants and animals that have died and are been buried underground, uh, they will eventually form some new coal or oil or gas, but that takes millions of years. So we don't consider it as renewable. It's non-renewable because uh, within our lifetime or a hundred other lifetime, lifetimes, it's never going to end. Uh, sorry, never going to recover. So uh, really quick look at the different types of power stations. The first is what we call a chemical power station, which we use coal or oil or gas. And basically what happens is this. We uh, get some coal, and what we do is we burn the coal. And when we burn the coal, it releases heat to boil some water. And when we boil the water, it changes the steam, and the steam moves at high speeds. This means the steam now has kinetic energy. It moves at high speeds. hits what we call a turbine, and this turbine starts to spin. It's basically a big fan. And when the turbine spins, and this is the most important part, it turns a generator. Remember that generator that had a coil between the you know, poles of a magnet? When it spins, it generates electricity. That's what we want. So basically what happens is this. We've converted chemical energy from the coal to heat, which we use to boil the water and move the steam, which is kinetic, and to move the turbine, which is still kinetic, and then it generates electricity. This fuel could be coal, could be oil, could be gas, could be anything. Great. Nuclear power stations use something called a nuclear reactor. This is very, very, very similar to uh, the chemical power station. When it comes to the process, they also look the same, but the start or the beginning of the process is different. Inside the nuclear reactor, a process called nuclear fission occurs. Nuclear fission, if you remember, is when you take a nucleus and you break it and it splits into smaller pieces, releasing a lot of heat and light. Releasing a lot of heat and light. So when you release a lot of heat and light, uh, the light's not important, but the heat is, you boil the water in this container, in this boiler. The, boil turn, the water turns to steam, the steam moves, it also has kinetic energy, hits the turbine, the turbine spins, spins your generator, and then the generator converts kinetic energy to electrical energy. So. There we go. Nuclear power stations. Okay? Cool. Basically, they're the same design. Now, these are the only two non-renewable sources of energy. Now, let's take a look at the renewables really quick. First, the hydroelectric power station. The hydroelectric power station uses flowing water from a river, all right, or a lake, uh, just like I said, and we have a dam along the way. So when we block the water, the level of the water rises, it keeps rising, 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 and as the water rises, it has gravitational potential energy, it stores potential energy. And then you open up so, uh, a space in the dam, an opening, it could be on the top here, it could be at the bottom, it doesn't really matter. Mohim, we allow the water to start flowing down. When the water flows down, it converts its gravitational energy into kinetic, and that's what we want, because we want this water to smash into the turbine, we want it to spin, and as it spins, it turns on the generator. And, you know, the rest of the water flows out, but the generator generates electricity. So we have gravitational energy from the stored water, kinetic energy from the flowing water, and electrical energy generated by the generator. Uh, you'll notice a very recurring theme here, which is a 
في تيربين وجنريتر هنا دائما تيربين وجنريتر تيربين وجنريتر so it doesn't really matter next up geothermal another renewable source of energy now geothermal is kind of like coal and uh, nuclear in terms of it uses boiling water like we heat the water using heat from the earth like underground if you start digging deep underground you have lots of rocks and you know patches of earth that are at a very high temperature they're very hot you know uh, the, de the deeper you go the hotter the earth becomes you know mantle crust and so on and so forth but we use this natural heat to heat up some water which turns to steam the steam rises up steam rises up and goes ahead and hits a turbine which spins and then when the turbine spins it spins the generator which generates electricity طبعاً the water is condensed and you end up with a cycle so the idea here is you take heat energy from the earth you convert it to kinetic energy which is the steam and the turbine and then you convert it to electrical energy in the generator so it follows the exact same sequence as before okay finally we have three other types of you know methods of generating electricity uh, all of them are very direct they immediately convert something to electrical energy out tool there are no other steps the first would be the wind turbine turbine does nothing more than take the kinetic energy from the wind and it spins the turbine the space in the back is actually a generator that block in the back is a generator and it converts electrical energy into kinetic uh, sorry kinetic into electrical energy right away we have turbines that we put in the ocean so we can take advantage of the movement of the waves so when a wave passes by especially really strong waves as the waves pass by they start to move this floating turbine which is connected inside itself uh, to a generator so it immediately converts kinetic energy of the waves to electricity cool the last but not least and last but not least the can't even speak now. I've run out of energy. Ah. Uh, would be solar panels. Solar panels just convert sunlight to electrical energy. Also, yani it just receives sunlight, and through what we call a uh, like a photoelectric process, it converts the energy from the light into electricity that immediately flows. There's no kinetic energy. There's no turbine. This is important to note. This is the only way to generate electricity without a turbine and without a generator there is no turbine and there is no generator when it comes to solar panels okay cool last but not least the sun itself also the sun big ball of you know nuclear fusion we didn't say it's a fire it's just nuclear fusion uh, is the source of coal and oil hydroelectric wind and solar energy but you might be asking why the sun is the source of coal and oil because all of the living organisms and i mean plants and animals that lived long ago and died and got buried underground and got converted to coal and oil and gas uh, they were alive due to the sun so we say the sun is the source of coal oil and gas because of that it's kind of a stretch so hydroelectric energy is also originated from the sun or just originates from the sun that's because the sun you know evaporates the water in the ocean so it rises up and forms clouds and these clouds eventually move elsewhere and they rain and filling up lakes and forming rivers and stuff like that so it's due to what we call the water cycle or the rain cycle i'm pretty sure you're familiar with this the sun is also the source of wind because the wind when it comes to the earth moves from one spot to another due to differences in temperature like spaces with high temperature and spaces with low temperature the wind starts to move sometimes from high to low from low to high depending on the regions we're talking about but the re reason wind even exists is because of temperature differences and temperature differences on planet earth exist due to the sun finally i think it would be a shame if we don't say that the sun is the source of solar energy that would be foolish so and last and <laughs> it's at last we're done uh we're done with the curriculum now and we've done revising we're done revising everything yay uh did i miss earth come on uh, I'm, I'm pretty tired خلاص already
Modern problem in front of modern solutions. Dude, you're twisted. Why can't you just put corpses of animals in a chemical power station and burn them? Sure you can, but the problem is, and that's that's a really big problem, uh, they're not very energy efficient. Like, they don't have a lot of energy to burn off in the first place. That's why we don't just use the corpses of animals. When they get converted to coal and oil and gas uh, under pressure, they become much more energy dense. Uh, okay. We're done. Congratulations, everybody. Yay. Uh, we finished the entire syllabus in a week. That's excellent. Uh, make sure to just go back, rest a bit, go over the material again. I'll be sending you revision sheets uh, on your respective groups, uh, groups, groups uh, shortly. Uh, I hope to finish this before I mention a few things before I'm done. Uh, next week. I'll send you a schedule for next week, uh, tomorrow, probably, Sunday at most, so that we can start, you know, practicing with each other. I'm probably going to be using Zoom with each class, but I'll also have a few quick streams here on YouTube. They might be unplanned because all I'm planning on doing is just leaving a, a recording of uh, past paper solutions and such. So when we want to solve past papers together, I could just ask you to solve said past paper and then follow through with the solution online instead of uh, doing it live with everybody else. Sure, there'll still be live videos, but they won't be planned and uh, you won't, it won't be mandatory for you to watch them as I, uh, as I explain things live. What's important would be the recording here. Anyway, it's been great, guys. I've had a uh, wonderful week. And I hope to see you guys next time. Ah, oh, young out, if you can get the reference. Ha <laughs> ha.